From Chicago's CAN TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs, and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. So hi again, everyone, and welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. Welcome to another show. So we start the show off today with a question for you. Um, how are you consuming this particular program? You as a, as a television slash news consumer, are you watching us on your iPhone or your smartphone? Are you uh, maybe watching it at your, at your desktop computer? Are you downloading the iTunes audio feed and listening to us on the train? Maybe you're actually watching it on television, watching uh, CAN TV on a, on a conventional television. There's lots of ways to watch even our modest little show, and I think that brings up the question that we're in a time, as we all know, of intense change in the media and how we get the information, how we get the bits and bytes and megabytes that uh, make up our daily news digest. Well, one of the guests who's with us today is Tom Clark. Tom Clark has, uh, is the lead author, I guess you could say, of, of this particular thing, a study about news, the new news 2010. And we're gonna be talking in some depth about the things that Tom found out. It's like eight million, is it? Eight million individual uh, clicks or something? Eight million sets of eyes during the month of May. Yeah, and, and, and where they all went. We're gonna talk about that. And, and also joining us today uh, is a, an eclectic but very smart panel of people who are involved in some way or another in the new media. And those would include Neil Tesser, who I've known for a very long time when Neil was a jazz host and we were working together at uh, WBEZ. Uh, now a blogger and jazz critic for uh, uh, Examiner, Jazz Examiner. Uh, we have Ray Hanania with us. Ray is, is, is an interesting character because Ray's been around since the dawn of new media. But today, I, I think it would be safe to say that if you just pick up an iPhone, probably the first thing you're going to see is you because you're just kind of like you've managed to make yourself ubiquitous i'm in, a media refugee yeah you are video audio print everything he does it all esther Sebeda is with us today too sometimes columnist and 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 one of the reasons i want to have esther on the show is because i've just coincidentally gone to a lot of conferences with Esther in the last year or so. <laughs> and when you see Esther, she always has, she's like clutching an armful of <laughs> smartphones and laptops and everything else. I think she even has a pager with her just in case <laughs> somebody, somebody needs to reach her. So these are folks who have, who have gone full, uh, full tilt into the new media world. And we're gonna be talking about all of that. So it's the tradition around here to the extent that a seven week old show can have a tradition that we talk about what's going on in the news, uh, what's, uh, what's got our uh, click finger exercise this week. Um, I just arbitrarily, Mr. Tesser, would you start? What, what, uh, what, what's got your attention this week? Well, I, I know, the key in, in everybody's mind right now is the uh, Courtney Cox, David Arquette breakup. <laughs> but we'll just move beyond that for now, because that's, um, you know, uh, Jay Cutler. Let's let's turn to sports for a minute. Sports, All right, let's turn I'm to sports. Sure, uh, sure, I know, Ken, that you don't give a fig about sports, actually. So, But but some people do, yes, including I know, probably I'm aware some people this. watching yeah, this program. Yeah. And uh, Jay Cutler was out for a week or two with a concussion. Mm -hmm. This is part of the NFL's new rules about uh, if there's a concussion, you have to keep the player out of the game until you're sure he's better. And the reason for that is because you've got guys in their 30s and 40s who are showing up with uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, uh, Alzheimer's-like dementia, mm -hmm. which has been certainly, it's being shown, caused by repeated concussions that haven't been properly treated. Now they're starting to find this in college kids. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm not a football fan. Uh, quite frankly, and, and one reason is because the way the game has changed, as guys have gotten bigger and faster, the violence of the collisions just turns me off. Now it turns out that it's not just turning me off, it's turning them into vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that f considering how much people invest in their Sunday football watching, this is going to be something that people have to consider. That game may have to change in ways that uh, those who watch it for the bloodlust mm -hmm. aren't going to like. But, uh, and this this was a, this was a high profile case in in the case of the Bears. I mean, th this is uh, well, it's high profile in Chicago, but it's been happening with major uh, professional and college quarterbacks around the country. This just brought it home to Chicago in a way that I don't think Chicagoans have had to pay attention to since Daryl Stingley was speared 
what, 30 years ago and turned into a paraplegic. He was a, a, a running back that, uh, that became a famous case because he was rehabbing at the Chicago Rehab Clinic, and uh, he became sort of the poster boy for uh, dirty play on the football field. He was turned into, a, you know, he was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Yeah, it's a terrible story, but you just touched on the one thing that hasn't changed in news media with all the technology, and that is the drive for the audience to see tragedy. We slow down for tragedy. Yep. You know, on the expressway, we read it on the front page. Nobody puts the little, you know, Cub Scout walking the old lady on the front page of a newspaper. And uh, that is never going to change, I don't think. The well, fact they put that, it on the front page if, if they get run over by a truck. Or if they have nothing else to write. <laughs> if we have a or 1,300 thing. to 1,500 reporters suddenly descending on the miners in, in Chile. Um, speaking of concussions, I think we, an another interesting story in the media landscape is that we may have discovered that Sam Zell has ridden his motorcycle without a helmet to Wapen. <laughs> uh, because the Tribune management is just um, wow. really imploding, including a, uh, a suspension this week after yet, uh, yet another racy, inappropriate, suspension. misogynist mm -hmm. email went out from one of his lieutenants. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the good folks who are still turning out news and entertainment and whatnot at WGN and the Tribune must be really wondering what's going on. And I don't know how this is going to affect the bankruptcy uh, proceedings, but one of the things that occurred to me as I read all this um, is that maybe one outcome is that the employees that are left may actually own the company when they're all said and done because, because these creditors and other people have clearly shown they didn't know what was up. Well, how does Randy Michaels uh, issue the statement that he did yesterday that he's shocked, shocked, by such by such behavior in his underlings, when he in, he in the New York Times story is is alleged to have been doing just exactly the same thing. I mean, when does it go up to Randy Michaels? Well, I'll, we'll see. Allegedly, the reporter of that famous front page New York Times story, which is another whole thing we could get into. Why was there a front page story about trip management? <laughs> but it, I, I understand that that reporter is out to get Randy Michaels. Mm -hmm. That even as this bankruptcy Carr. goes on, you're talking about uh, David Carr, the media yes, reporter, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, that there is great disdain uh, for how the Tribune, uh, the, this legacy paper, mm -hmm. which, like everybody else, has radically redone the newsroom, reduced staff. That's part of what our study was about last year and this year. Um, you know, the future of news from the legacy newspaper point of view is is up in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all searching for what the business model is going to be, as are the newer uh, hyperlocal news editors and bloggers and whatnot are also trying to figure out how to pay rent. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting how this is going to pan out. And I'm sure he was talking because this will affect the court case. Yeah. And just going down that line of how things have changed, they've evolved to the point where there were a couple of uh, high uh, profile stories in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times this week about longtime print columnists going over to electronic Absolutely. only media and yeah. uh, you know what that means and you know what's going on with Newsweek and you know it's just mm -hmm. it's all you would think that two years later you know we've been having this conversation since you know you mm -hmm. called your ta town mm -hmm. hall you would think that two years later there would have been a settling that there would have been some kind of path forward but it's still the wild west out there which is interesting which which raises and a very scary and scary and it yeah. raises a very interesting question for me because God knows I don't think there's anyone around this table who are going to have too much nice to say about, you know, Randy Michaels or Lee Abrams or even Kevin Matheny over at WGN. They've, been, they've all been the subject of great um, disdain from, from the media. But I, often, I just kind of imagine that I had been put in a position or any one of us had been put in that position. Uh, that was what they were brought in for. They were brought in to shake things up. They were brought in to just completely dismantle the, the old way of thinking and, and you know, sort of do things in a new way. Well, is is that part of what's going on here? But it's not a new way. It's only new to newspapers. It's not new to shock jock schlock radio, which is where they all came from. So the idea that you could come in and try to take something that is as actually important to the democracy. I mean, the First Amendment is there because we're supposed to be informed so that we can vote. So to take a newspaper and apply total entertainment standards and really low bar, low standard entertainment standards of that <laughs> to a newspaper, that's the mistake. That's, I mean, shaking it up is one thing, but they didn't. They only shook it up in terms of newspapers. What they did was the same old radio garbage. And again, to put it in context, you know, the 
private sector is littered with bad shakeups and bad managers that may have been good at a mid-level executive position that did not have mm -hmm. the critical business and leadership skills to move a game forward. So is it that surprising that something as complex as a media operation would not be able to find an, you know, an appropriate leader to really do something with it? And you know, where are they? This issue with the Tribune, though, bothers me a little bit, and I'll tell you why. I, I look at myself as an accidental journalist. I'm Middle Eastern. We come into this thing thinking that, you know, the media is out to get us. I should have been a doctor. I don't know how I ended up in journalism. <laughs> I become a journalist, and I discover, wow, journalism is more political than the politicians. <laughs> why this story about the Tribune? Because, Ken, you and I were at City Hall. Remember, before the technology, we would cut out a picture from a paper. We'd paste it on a white sheet of paper, <laughs> and we'd write something so obnoxious and disgusting about the picture. And as journalists, we'd slap it up on the gag board, yes, we make fun of board, it, right, and right. it was a little circle. <laughs> now, today, we get people that, I get emails from people that send me the most outrageous links to the most disgusting things. Why was that a story? Because I've had politicians send me an email with something stupid and racist, and I ask myself, is he making a comment or is he just forwarding something? You know, it's too easy to do that. And I think that's where the technology... And you keep doing it. You do that enough, you can become governor of New York. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you could. Well, there's well, another implication, though. You can run though. for governor. <laughs> They're not going to become That's it. right. When I think of what Randy Michaels and his role at Clear Channel represents, um, this is not just finding the lowest common denominator in entertainment. Absolutely. Good we're point. We're talking about yeah. where are citizens going to get the information right, they need right, right. to make the right decisions. There's a story about the computerized Clear Channel station when a rail wreck happened in the mm -hmm. south and they wanted to get out a public service announcement so residents could know that there was dangerous chemicals leaking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. down the street there was no one at the station right. to answer the call all to put out the all emergency release. yeah that's uh, the legacy of folks like randy michael Tom, it is running so, the media it is so critical that you bring that up not to not to set aside neil's point about the entertainment value or lack thereof but but this is a very important point a bunch of us have had connections to radio through the years and it's a sore point with me and with a lot of other people that the corporatization of once great radio stations and uh, I, I, I mean I think we've we've had that experience where if you go to the you don't even you don't have to name one specific one you go you go to a place where the the corporate radio stations have all been brought into one location and it's kind of like a like a really bad zoo where <laughs> these once great powerful radio stations have been reduced to like a little tiny glass box with a computer in it and maybe an intern that goes in and feeds it once a day with some new voice tracks that's the radio station there's no commitment to news there's no commitment to public service there's barely a commitment to entertainment they just kind of sit there and just play all and that's day. the and that's clear channel that's the culture these people are coming from well that's where journalism is going I mean there was a time when I really enjoyed uh, looking and investigating a scoop and taking my time and breaking it and you got at least a chance to enjoy the glow of having broken a big major scoop today with or technology. Or enjoy actually learning about what you're reporting on and really you knowing it. That's learning yeah. facts. Now yeah. the pressure is so on you have to get it out there fast. You got to make quick judgments. You know I think that this example of the 33 miners in Chile this is a perfect example of where I think we're actually at a point where the tipping point in the change in journalism, the news media was actually getting in the way of the story. I did not need them to tell me the guy was stepping out of the tube because I was watching it live on my TV set all the way from Chile. They were stepping all over the story and, it, and, and I can see us, you know, the technology is moving so fast where we're going to start becoming the problems with our own profession. Oh, and this but, goes back to, you know, how many wars, you know, have been broadcast where the journalists were there, you know, looking at the little red lights in the sky, you know, before anything actually even happened. So, but I mean, you're missing it's just the real scoop, though, worse. that came out in the newspapers, which was that guy who had his wife and his mistress. Right. Oh, yeah. That was, a, that was the news story. You're yes. absolutely right. Is, is that the basis of a new Chilean sitcom or what? <laughs> now, here's but, the thing. Hold on one second. I'm already beginning to detect this, you know, like five, not 
absolutely young people sitting around talking about how everything is going to hell. And I'm getting really tired of it. I'm getting tired of all of us sitting around talking about how, oh, it used to be better once. Tom, this is where you come in. This is the perfect opportunity to segue into the new news 2010. Well, what, you, what I mean, let me ask you a question sure. first of all. We, we, we made reference to there were, in May of 2010, there were 8,000 unique 8 million. Eight, I'm sorry, 8 million unique visits to about 150 news, sites. news and blog sites. All right. In Chicago. In Chicago. In Chicago. And let me be very clear that about 70 of the 120 sites that we surveyed out of 150 that we looked at, and there's probably 300 in Chicago. Chicago is actually an amazing digital news incubator right now, probably more so than in other, any other place in the country. Um, which was sort of lost in the release of our report. Mm -hmm. But about 70 of those sites weren't even measured by the commercial tracking traffic thing. So I'm and talking that's because? Because they're too small or because the way their websites are set up, uh, Google Analytics or Compete.com can't find them the same way they can find the Tribune or Chicago now. But this is a point of reference, and we're going to look at it over several years and see how this shifts. But there's no doubt in my mind that the legacy newspapers have a bigger presence online now than they do in the print copy that still arrives on my porch every morning in three different versions. Um, and in fact, during May, there were about eight million sets of eyes that looked at about a third of the 120 sites that we were tracking and surveying and trying to get a sense of how are they set up, who's running them, what does it cost, are they, are they, are they breaking even, stuff like that. And um, six of those eight million eyes were sometimes Tribune in Chicago now. So that's, the legacy see, papers a, are still at the core of what most of us in the online environment are reacting to, commenting on, using as our point of reference or our frame mm -hmm. for the news. And so the question still remains with, and last year we documented how much less news those legacy sites are actually covering with the smaller news staffs they have after Randy Michaels and Sam Zell have cut everybody out. The question remains, are we getting the journalism we want and need? Mm -hmm. And I think we're beginning to see that this online environment, and quite frankly, these other three colleagues of mine represent this new trend, are beginning to find a way on the web to supply some of that information. They don't necessarily have the presence or the amplification effect mm -hmm. that an old Tribune has, but I think that's coming because my adult kids aren't paying attention to that newsprint that arrives on their doorstep. They're finding Esther and Ray and Neil's stuff other ways. Can I just jam a quick question in? I know everybody wants to jump in on this, but the the six million unique visits to these Tribune and sometimes in Chicago now, how would that compare to if it were 20 years ago and you were strictly in print? Is it, is it more people consuming news or is it well, about the Well, there's a little apples and oranges here because if you think of, in rough terms, uh, the Sun-Times, let's say 10 years ago at about four or five hundred thousand in circulation per day. In the Tribune at six or seven hundred thousand and double that for the weekend. And I'm going back maybe 15 years. Um, and think of how much time us older folks spent with that Sunday paper. And how little time we spend with it today or how little time we spend during that one unique visitor visit to one story for 90 or 120 seconds. It's a different experience. Now, if we're downloading a podcast, maybe we're listening to that for an hour. If we're looking at a YouTube video, maybe we're there for four minutes. Maybe, in fact, we've gone to 20 sites, and that means we're 20 of those unique set of eyes going to different sites. So I think we don't know quite yet how to measure the difference between the audited circulation delivery of a printed product or the amount of time that was spent with that product versus how we all consume information on the web today, which is far briefer, quicker, shorter bites of time. Are we learning more that way? Well, we have much more available, although there are questions about discernment and, and uh, vetting and, you know, do I know who the source is? Um, there's a whole lot of work being done to figure out how to teach younger readers who are consuming primarily by the web how to make those kind of judgments. Because right now, the Tribune meant one kind of source. Um, I don't know if um, uh, Drudge or Huffington Post uh, equals what the Tribune used to. 
And there's a final point. As John, the late John Callaway pointed out in your town hall meeting a year and a half ago, um, watch what we are romancing that we want a return to. The Tribune itself was a pretty um, one-sided point of view kind of source of news at one point. And not all the voices that needed to be in the public debate ever made it into that public square. And they are Absolutely. now. They have an opportunity through the web to enter into the debate. That's, the that's my whole story. You know, there was nobody really accurately covering Latino issues nationally or in the city, and I was there. And I, you know, that I got to do that. That's where where I came in. That that's where the value was. And just on the point of consuming media, you know. I used to, you know, 15 years ago, I used to spend my, my morning time with my newspapers and then not think about any of this again until 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> Today, I've got my iPod, I've got text messages, I've she got does. email can, alerts, I've got, I you know, I've got that. the websites, you know, the Google alerts coming. We had I to interact. ask her to put all that stuff in the, in the control room. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was I hard mean, to pry You know, people hands. spend <laughs> so much more time with news today than they used to but again it's dispersed and it's you know it may be you know people are only interested in the Chilean miners today and tomorrow it's going to be Christina Aguilera's breakup. Well, we've turned, you know, we've turned news Christina into... Christina Aguilera broke up? <laughs> <laughs> How did that escape right our down. attention? We've turned news into gossip okay this is a That's gossip true. industry you cannot have the new media though I think you know and all the stuff that I've done with the new technology you cannot have the new media though without the old media. The fact is Absolutely. that you know you're Absolutely. talking about at the old media still is the way to market what you have. So I have 14 blogs. I got seven websites. I got an iPad and Android. I got a laptop, and I still have to write for mainstream newspapers. You know, and it still makes me proud. You know, the creators is distributing the column, and I still do a radio show because out of all that media, the radio show is the one time where I'm actually talking to a real reader or audience member. It's the one moment mm -hmm. where I'm really just cutting through everything and having a real conversation. Well, let's go back to what you were saying about people using these major uh, media, the, yeah. the, the, news, the newspapers, but online. This goes back to something that, that I was thinking about back at your town hall uh, um, event and that I think I spoke about at the time. And I don't have a problem with the idea that people are getting their news there. The problem is that people expect that for free. And as you say, it cuts down on the, on the um, um, income, it cuts down on the availability of resources, on the number of people you can hire. And yet, almost everything that is worth reading, as your survey showed, and that people are reading and commenting on, comes from the old media, yeah. even though it's in a new format. Right. So we have this, this very strange model where the new media, which depends on the old media for its gravitas, is set up on a business model that is destroying the old media, which it depends on for its gravitas. It's a, it's a snake eating its own tail. And unless we can figure out how to get around that, I think that this becomes a spiral. Um, oh, it, but I think, that, I think that the old media has figured out how to get about that by itself using people who don't get paid. Well. Okay. Chicago now is getting a million sets of those unique eyes, and they don't pay their bloggers much of anything. Okay. It is a fascinating business model. And it's old media inside new media. And it's but one that I'm sort of involved with. I, I write about jazz for this uh, site called examiner.com. Yes. Examiner.com, I think, is in like 200 cities now. And basically, it's a local portal that has people writing at all levels of expertise and at, on all kinds of things. I mean, when I started, there was a woman... I live in the Wicker Park area. It was the Wicker Park Neighborhood Examiner. As far as I could tell, she was some woman in her 70s who sat home and wrote about what she saw on the sidewalk in front of her house. But she was in six times a week, so she made more money than I did. But the <laughs> point is that, that, that uh, but that's, you can have all those things, but if you do have people who are doing it for free, who don't have any training, who are running with stories that are not verified, are we really serving anybody, and how do we get around that? We refer to cookie jar financed mom and pop bloggers as also the place where some really interesting stuff is going on. Absolutely. And actually, some of those people used to be paid journalists, so they're not all untrained. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate this labor of love aspect of how the web content has evolved um, is still something we're grappling with. Anyone, Raise your hand if, if you were once a full-time paid journalist in the city of Chicago. <laughs> so anyone who claims it's that they have an idea of what the future business model is going to be they're, they're joking you because no one has figured this out yet. But we do see some interesting things evolving. 
there is active discussion about building a advertising network where these smaller sites could begin to pool some of their resources to attract some of the ad money. Although, rough equation, only about 40% of the cost of doing some of this online stuff is currently being covered by ads. Um, membership models like public broadcasting is another aspect of this. And the Chicago News Cooperative, which really hasn't shown us much yet except for their New York Times material Except for their and ability Sundays. to get a story on the front page of the New York Times about their former employer, the Tribune. Exactly, <coughs> uh, including a picture of one of their board members who used to be <laughs> on the top of the no Tribune. No conflict there. Um, but uh, they are planning to have a paywall when they make their online site available in, ja in January, and we'll see if they attract so subscribers. they're doing that now with the, ma with the mayor's race. With uh, early and often. Early and often. Right, um, which, I have, which I subscribe which to. Which I do too, because I think it will beat uh, Capital Facts uh, as it gets and, up and running on local news. And there's a fear, though, that, uh, boy, we, are we going to charge our readers? Are we going to lose them? You know, at some point, you got to say, look, is the content good? Is it going to be there? I think you sell quality. Um, I, the one thing, though, that I think is really important about the new media is that the opportunity that it gave voices that felt that they had no voice in the mainstream media. That, to me, was the initial reason I got into the mm -hmm. computers <clears throat> and everything. It was a way to if you felt like, right or wrong, that you were up against a brick wall with the mainstream media, the internet gave you a chance to really reach people, and it's amazing how many people flock to that. Exactly. We're um, just about out of time already. I mean, I, I can't. I just can't believe this. There's, uh, there's. Uh, you want to hear my list of things that we didn't get to talk? <laughs> uh, you wrote them on a pad well, of paper. Well, the cop that wasn't actually a serial murderer. Oh, well, I mean, I just the thought. New the new plan I thought for maybe Chicago. if we had a minute, we could talk about the mayor's budget, <laughs> which was, uh, let's just say, a timid budget. As, as I understand it, there's 500 million dollars now left in that 99 years Skyway. Uh, deal which was at 1.82 billion a couple of years ago. Parking now there's 76 million dollars left in that 75 year deal that was 150 or 1.1. Ken, you want to million. talk about real news? Is that what we're talking about? No, I just thought maybe there'd be an opinion. Slip or two. into discussion of the impact of the Great Recession. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, something like the that. The new normal. Yeah, the new normal. Well, listen. Um, I hope you'll all come back again sometime. We'd really like to have you back. It's a, it, this is a very interesting conversation, and we don't have to just talk about media. We can talk about all the other things, too. I've been referring, of course, to Tom Clark, who's been here. He's the president of Chicago Media uh, uh, Workshop. workshop. <laughs> wow, I, how could I forget? Chicago Media Workshop, Tom Clark. Uh, Neil Tesser, uh, jazz examiner uh, and, and jazz critic, and just all around you know, know Super it. guy? Yeah, and, and, and know it all. <laughs> Esther J. Cepeda from the Sun Times, columnist from the Sun Times, but also, I think more importantly, an prolific independent blogger. prolific blogger. <laughs> and the prolific Ray Hanania. Uh, anybody, anything you want to plug? Radio Chicago and 8 a.m. Monday through Friday. And on uh, 1530 a.m., right? Yes, thank yeah. you. Used to work there a long time ago. Yep. So, uh, used to thank work you. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, well, we all used we to work there. We all got paid. You've for been it. watching <laughs> Chicago <laughs> Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. <clears throat> As you know, you can find us here, right here on, uh, on Can TV all the time. Watch us 6.30 on, on Thursday nights. But you can also see us whenever you want to see us online, and you can do that at cantv.blip.com. TV. Check us out there or subscribe on iTunes. We're all everywhere all the time. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Chicago Newsroom.